Hello, and welcome to the Gravel Ride Podcast. I'm your host, Craig Dalton. This week on the show, we've got Tony Pereira of Breadwinner Cycles from Portland, Oregon. This show is brought to you by our friends at Envy out in Ogden, Utah. You may remember a few weeks back, I attended the Envy Grodio out at their facility, and it was an amazing experience. I highly recommend trying to get a slot in the Grodio event next year. The course was right up my alley. Very technical at spots, very beautiful, a lot of climbing, a big day out, and quite an adventure. That combined with the custom builder roundup made for an incredible weekend. We got to see builders from around the world showcasing their works, including Tony from Breadwinner. I highly recommend you head over to envy.com and check out the photographs from the builder roundup, follow them on social media, and check out their products. I was particularly impressed with all the rigorous testing that was going on in that facility. It's amazing when you bring all the engineers, innovators, testers, all under one roof, what you can do. They were explaining that not only do they build everything in-house, but they also build all the machinery and tooling in-house for the testing. So they had all kinds of custom tests. It was particularly interested when I saw their frame testing jig, where which was flexing nonstop one of their custom frames that they just released this year. It was amazing how much abuse that frame could take. I was further impressed by the drop test that their wheels were undergoing. I remember thinking to myself that if you get a warranty claim and someone says they're just riding along, Envy can empirically say there's no way that's possible you did that much damage to these wheels because we've tested it at 10 times that impact rate. So big thanks to our friends at Envy for sponsoring this episode and a few others of the podcast. We couldn't continue doing what we're doing without their support. Head on over to Envy.com and check out everything they're doing to support the sport of gravel cycling. With all that said, let's dive right into my interview with Tony. Tony, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Craig. It's great to see you virtually from your office there in Portland. It's funny now that we're all accustomed to this, it makes it really easy. Yeah, it really is. If you don't have your setup dialed at this point, I don't think you ever will. Yeah, right. <laughs> Tony, let's start off a little bit by getting to know you and, and what led you to becoming a frame builder. It's been a while now. I worked in, I started out in the outdoor industry. I started working in ski shops when I was 16, which was in 1985. And I grew up working in ski shops. And then in college, I started working in a bike shop. And after college, I moved to Utah and skied and rode and worked in bike shops there. And I got really into the bike bike community when I lived in Salt Lake. Did that for quite a while. Eventually got bored of being a bike mechanic. Just hit my limit on that. And, and But I've always been a tinkerer, playing around in the garage, working on cars and motorcycles and, of course, bicycles. I learned how to raise a little and weld a little bit from a, a friend of my dad's. And then I just brought all those things together. And I, I was a fan of the old mountain bikes, the uh, Ibis and Salsa. And of course, the, the Richies. The Richies always had those beautiful, huge fillets. And, and I'm like, I, I knew how to braise. So I'm like, I wonder if I could make a mountain bike. And that was, that was two, this was 2002 or so. So almost 20 years ago. And the internet was there. We were using all like listserv type communication. But there's a pretty active, frame builder listserv that still exists. But I, I got on there and started figuring it out, built a couple mountain bikes. And I, after building one, I was like, oh man, I got to do this. Bringing my love of bikes together with making things. And and I, I just, I was hooked for sure. Riding that first bike is such a joyous moment. Uh, it's got to be an amazing feeling to ride yeah, something that really you've cool. actually made. Super gratifying. It yeah. sounds like you and I came up in the same era, which was that period of time where there was a lot of great mountain bike frame builders and custom steel bikes. Every state seemed to have a, a builder yep. of some notoriety. Yep. Yep. So how did you teach yourself? Was it really through, obviously you had a little bit of hands-on experience from your father's friend to teach you how to weld and know what equipment was needed. Were you able to glean some of the, the basic fundamentals from that listserv and ask questions? Yeah. Yeah. It was great. I know uh, Richard Sachs is one of the more professional frame builders that was on there. And he's always been really generous with his time. And there were a number of others as well, but I, I remember him in particular, but yeah, there was a great group of people that, that I, you know, some of them I'm still friends with. 
remember Steve Garo from Coconino was getting started at exactly the same time. And the two of us were like bouncing things off of each other and, and just getting our feet wet. But I, I am fortunate to have a natural aptitude for using tools and problem solving and figuring things out. So yeah, I was able to teach myself with the help of that listserv, obviously, how to make it all come together. And I look back on those early frames and I still have a couple of them and they, they were pretty bad. <laughs> the, first, the first 20 or so that I built for me and my friends, they were pretty rough. I, I should say rough. They weren't, the finish was rough. They worked fine, but I started building bikes for customers after about the first 20 or so bikes that mostly were, went to my friends and, uh, and they were starting to get pretty good by then. And did that and, just happen via word of mouth with the 20 out there? People would see it and say, oh, where yeah, did you get that thing so from? I had, some, I, I had a core group of friends in Salt Lake that worked in the bike shop with me or were associated with the bike shop uh, called Wild Rose. It was an early mountain bike scene, mount bike shop. And two of my friends, Alex and Jeff, they were all, they were 100% on board with me. They were like, yeah, you got to do this and we're going to help you build us some bikes. Let's go racing and, and. We, we went out, we were all mountain bikers, so we were out riding uh, single speeds in the Interim Mountain Cup Series in Utah, which is a, I think still exists, it was a really popular mountain bike series. There were, I think there were 10 races around the whole state, and we got out there and we were top five racers in the single speed category. And we started doing that, we would do 24 hours of Moab every year. So we just got out there, we just put it out there. and. We were having fun and people liked what we were doing. And I know our very first, my very first customer, he, he was a guy that we beat in a race. And he came up to me at the end of the race. He was like, you guys are having fun. I want one of those. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Were you operating under the breadwinner brand at that point? No, that was Pereira Cycles. Okay. So yeah. a names, namesake brand at that point. Right. So that was in Utah and in 2004 or so. And then I moved to Portland in 2005. And when I moved here, I decided not to get a job and, and go in full-time building bikes. I had a few orders under my belt and, and I just, I went for it and it worked out. And did you stay under your namesake as the brand? I, yeah, it was Pereira Cycles until 2013. Okay. And that's when I hooked up with Ira, who had been building under his name, Ira Ryan. And, and we started Red Winner. What about that partnership with Ira made it attractive? Do you two bring different perspectives and skill sets to the table? Yeah, yeah, different types of riders, but of a like mind as far as their our eye for style and, and quality. We both worked with the Rafa clothing company in their very early years. We were friends with the guys that got it going here in, in when they were based in Portland. And our friend Daniel conceived of this project called the, the Continental. And it was a group of riders, originally six riders, and Ira and I were two of them, who rode around first in the Northwest here. And we had a photographer along with us, and they would made, made some beautiful images and created that whole brand that's now Rafa. Like a lot of that, the imagery that they still use is of that same style but like big mountain rides. And we were actually doing a lot of gravel riding on 23 millimeter tires and on our road bikes, but riding some really cool around the epic kind of rides that everybody makes fun of Rafa for now. Um, <laughs> I certainly remember that era when those yeah. vis visuals and videos came out and they were, yeah. they were certainly evocative of where ultimately gravel slotted in this mm -hmm. big mountain adventure not your Saturday group, not your normal Saturday group ride type right. of riding. Yeah, that was super fun. And out of that, Rafa asked us to build, they, they decided that they were gonna get five bike companies. We were the smallest one and market a line of bikes. That was all through their website. They took the orders and then we would, we build the bikes. And I, I can't, if I remember, I don't remember exactly. It was like Chinelli. I know Chinelli was one of them. It's, they're slipping my mind now, but they're all like big bike brands. And then it was me and Ira. <laughs> and, and we were the only ones that, that were on that Continental team. So we called that bike the Continental. And it had my logo on the right side of the down tube and Ira's on the left side of the down tube. He built mostly with lugs. So it had a lugged head tube and a uh, top tube, seat tube junction. And then the bottom bracket was billet raised, which is my style. Interesting. And what a neat collaboration. Together, we sold 22 of them, though not very many. 
But out of that, we found that we really liked working together. And, and we were like, all right. And honestly, we made some good money off of it. Like building that many, that was how many bikes each of us would build in a year. Right. Yeah, back then I was building 25 bikes a year or maybe even a little less. Yeah, it's it's funny and, in talking to other builders, you talk you think about the pace in which these bikes get built. If you're building them all by yourself, 2 3 weeks to build a bike is about what it takes and do the math. You can't do much yeah. more than 20 25 in a year. And and you nailed it. We were doing the math and we're like, "All right, we can't scale what we're doing now anymore." Some people can. There's a few builders out there that can crank them out, but we couldn't. So we're like, let's figure out a way to keep building bikes, but make more of them and uh, maybe make a little bit of a living. And it, the breadwinner name was really s something that we hung on that first Rafa project. It was just what we used to, to open a bank account. We never had any plans to make it a brand. It was kind of an inside joke. Like, yeah, I love that. Yeah, we can't make bread any other way. This is the breadwinner right. project. Yeah, yeah. My my son had just been born. Ira had just gotten married. We were like, we got to figure something out here. And then we just started calling it breadwinner. It was, again, a joke between us. But a year or two later, actually a year after the Rafa thing, we got approached by the folks that were starting up Shinola. Yep. Which is now mostly a watch company. Sure. I remember those bikes. Were, they, were you behind them? Bikes as well. And we designed their bike and built, built some prototypes for them. And we got paid well for that. And we took that money and started Breadwinner. With it. Okay. Yeah. You know, it's, it, I imagine it's always a challenge as a frame builder. Once you have the knowledge of all the different types of machinery that could make your process more efficient, acquiring said machinery is a big financial out outlay. So yeah. having those rare opportunities like with Shinola and Rafa before that, I'm yep. sure really accelerated your ability to be a, a builder that can kick out more than 20 a year. Yeah, it helped. It gave us a little bit of time to come up with some new ideas. Like we could sit back and go, okay, what do we want this? What do we want this thing called breadwinner to, to be? And we realized that a lot of our customers who were waiting a year or sometimes two years to get their bike, at the end of that long wait, they were often not happy. There are lots of opportunities for things to go wrong and, or for them to just lose interest or just, it just, it's too long. So we said, all right, with breadwinner, we're going to deliver the bikes in eight to 12 weeks. And that we've tried to do that the whole time. We've done pretty well until this last year. And now that's completely out the window. It's six months now. Fortunately, everybody's waiting that long for a Grupo at this moment. So you're all right. Yeah, the frames we can turn around, we can build the frames in the same amount of time if we can get materials. There's, we're running out of tubes, we're running out of head tubes or bottom bracket shells or whatever it is. Um, and we've had moments where we just have to stop. We can't build bikes in the last year. That's really been unusual. But then our painter's backed up because there's this bike boom, so he's extra busy. And But anyway, yeah, so it's a little longer now, but yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Ira's always been more of a, a road rider and a gravel rider. He won the first Trans Iowa gravel race. And I've been a mountain biker. I started mountain biking in 87 and, and started riding a road bike when I rode with those Rafa guys. Yeah, so it sounds like at, at the inception of Breadwinner, did you see the market opportunity being a little bit more adventurous road bike style? Not particularly. We, that was just simmering. So our first lineup, we didn't have a, a gravel bike. Sure. In our lineup. Yeah. And what, was it a, a mountain bike, frame? Go ahead. A road bike, the Continental, which is a classic steel fork road bike. We still have that. Uh, the Lolo's our road bike, still our, our mainstay road bike. We have the JB Racer, which is our cross-country mountain bike. And then a, a city bike called the Arbor Lodge, which is the neighbor we, neighborhood we lived in. And uh, we had a touring bike, which we don't actually don't offer anymore. So that was it, six bikes that first year. And I believe it was the next year when we came out with the B Road. Okay. Which is now our most popular bike. And that was our first gravel bike. Interesting. So how long did, what did that look like in terms of the proportion of which frames were selling? And when did you start to see that, hey, the B Road is actually the bike that is most um, appealing? At first we didn't have it. So it was, we were mostly selling Lolos. That was our Lolos and Continentals, definitely on the road side. And then we put the B road out there and the low, the road bikes were still more popular for that first. 
So that would have been 2014, 15. I think in 2016, it started to shift yep. significantly. And then it was like 50% road bu- or gravel bikes. And then we came out, I think we came out the G road the following year. And now it's like 60 or 70% gravel bikes. Yeah. Gravel slash bike packing bikes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That seems that, that tracks with what I imagine would happen. It seems on point. I was imagining that based on your sales stats, you would have your finger on the pulse of where and when that gravel product started to break and break free of the pack. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's been, yeah, it's been four years or so where it's been clearly the front runner. And I feel like this year we did a few more road bikes and some of those were people that had bought gravel bikes from us and they're like, all right, now I want a road bike. Yeah. People still have their quivers and the gravel bikes have been real quiver, quiver busters. A lot of people use those bikes for everything. You, when you come around, you're like, all right, I want a real fast bike too. Yep. And then you get that road bike. Yeah. And out. I think as we were talking about offline, the geometry changes in mountain bikes have made them a different beast than what we were riding in the late nineties Yeah. and yeah. a hell of a lot more fun. Yeah. And I imagine that's a kind of a growing segment of interest because people are looking for something special to have underneath them. For in the mountain bike world, uh, I would love to sell more mountain bikes, but the reality of it is that we, it's a niche thing for us. So we do a handful of mountain bikes a year. Yeah. Uh, I love them. I, our good water is my all time favorite bike, but those it's designed around the, the plus tires. So I've been running two sixes or two eights on it lately, but man, that's just such a fun bike for all, all around riding. And yeah, you're right. The geometry's changed. I think because forks have gotten longer, it's forced us to change the bikes. But the other thing that's changed a whole lot is the trails. We went from old hiking trails that were rocky and not necessarily flow, just go picking your way through through these trails to trails that are built for bikes, built for mountain bikes with berms and jumps and rollers and you know all kinds of features. So the bikes have had to, had to evolve with the trails. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we, I, I love riding the hardtails and the, the, they're super fun. That's been a good that has been a fun evolution to be to feel like i've been let's talk about the mountain bike one of the bikes you're bringing out to utah for the envy builder roundup yeah. i know some of the listeners have probably caught pictures of it already but why don't you talk us through that model sure i told you about my friends jeff and alex that helped me get started mountain bike with breadwinner or with uh, Pereira cycles jeff his name is jeff bates he passed away a number of years ago of skin cancer and so the first mountain bike that we made was called the JB Racers, named after him. We still and we still have it. That's our classic 29er hardtail cross country machine. And we will always have that in our lineup. It's very similar to the bikes I was making under the Pereira banner. Talking about this trail evolution, a few years ago I started riding a bunch at a, a trail system here near Portland called Sandy Ridge. And it's this new Imba style flow trails that are built just for mountain bikes. And that cross country bike is not the right bike for that. So I'm like, all right. And I'd had this in my head for a few years. I'm like, I think I want to build something that's more slack. It's a bigger fork, still a hard tails. There weren't a lot of them happening at the time, but finally I'm like, all right, I'm building this thing. And so pretty slacked out. I think at the time that was a 66 degree head tube angle. Um, with a 164, it was around 27.5 wheels, was the first generation of that Otis. And we started, so we, we came up with the design and when it came time for a name, I thought about my buddy, Alex, who's the other guy that helped me start, get started. And he's a funny guy and he'd always come up with these funny sayings and give everybody nicknames and just had these funny phrases. And he, one of them was, when he'd see a cool bike or something, he would say, dude, that's bad Otis. Just out of nowhere, I don't know where it came from, but he just used to say it all the time. So I'm like, that's a great name for a bike. I'm gonna call the bike Bad Otis. So call the bike Bad Otis, we bring it to the to North American Handmade Bike Show, which was in, uh, I don't remember where it was that year. Sacramento. Sacramento, probably. yeah. Yeah, I think it was Sacramento. Brought the Bad Otis to Sacramento, big hit. We got some nice press on it. A couple weeks later, I get a note from a guy on Facebook and his name's Bad Otis. He's like, hey, like I see Bad Otis pop up in my messenger. Hey man, why do you have this bike 
called Bad Otis. That's my name. And I was <laughs> like, I don't know who you are, but tell me why that's your name. And it turns out he's a fairly well-known artist in the punk rock world. Interesting. In the L.A. punk rock, like old school, 70s, 80s. He was like the t-shirt artist that did like Circle Jerks and Black Flag and like all those. I might be wrong about some of those bands, but he if you see his work, it's like it's of that era. And he's still a working artist. And we had a conversation. I was like, I'm like, man, I don't know anything about you. I, I wish I did because I'd want some of your I would have wanted some of your stuff back then. This is just a name that came out of nowhere from my friend. And he was like, all right, that's cool. <laughs> he was totally cool about it, but he thought he's been ripped off over the years. You know, like people that work in that realm, there's counterfeiters making ripoffs of his old T-shirt designs from, yeah. from the 80s. And he's had enough of it. So he saw his name pop up and he's like, oh, here's another one. And it turns out there was, it wasn't, that wasn't the case, but long story that uh, has nothing to do with the bike, but funny about the name. Anyway, last year... We've seen this long travel hardtail, so big fork hardtail of a ball over, over the past few years. There's a lot of them out there. And just like with the full suspension bikes, to get in really slack and the head tube angle, tend to have a longer front center, so much longer top tube, but with a steep seat tube, which gives you a lot more stability when you're in the air, you're diving into berms, you're going down really steep stuff. And we said, hey, we should try this. I guess maybe a year ago, we built a bike for I, and it was for a, a Chris King event. And, uh, and he, he's been riding that for the past year or so. And so just, again, slacker, I think we went to a 64 degree head tube angle or something like that. And his really steep, like 76 degree seat tube angle. And so it climbs, you get your weight far enough forward that the front end doesn't want to wander around. But then once you put your dropper down, you stand up, you've got that hard charging, like super slack bike. Yeah, I find it really interesting. Just it, it helps looking at those bikes helps me think about gravel geometry in many ways. Not that mm. there's any parallels between the two, but I've often had trouble like figuring out what does the steepness of a seat tube angle do? What does the head tube angle do? And the, the more I play around with different bikes and different equipment, you start to see it. Yeah. And some of these things creep their way. Some of these philosophies, not these extremes, creep their way into gravel bikes at in one shape or form, I imagine. Yeah, yeah. Well, you've got that, I forgot what it's called, the transition. They have that crazy that isn't the uh, slack thing. Yeah, the evil chamois. Hagar, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Um, Tony, let's talk about the gravel bikes in your lineup. And yeah, sure, I'd be sure. curious for you to describe to the listener the different models, A, and, and the different tube sets that you use. And with carbon being like the material du jour that a lot of these bikes get pumped out on, why don't you talk to the listener about what a steel bike can do and how it feels and why it's so special? Sure, sure. I, I think car there are many wonderful carbon bikes. There's nothing wrong. I'm not like a agnostic gotta have steel steel is real guy i have been but i've left all that behind i think there are many great materials for bikes the thing that that keeps us making steel bikes is how great it is for custom bike yeah and small production small scale production so there are i don't know how many hundred hundreds of different tubes to choose from so we can really vary the the ride of the bike based on the two parameters. So your two parameters are the diameter, the wall thickness, and then the butt pro, budding profile. So steel tubes are thicker on the ends. We call that the butt. And everyone's heard of butted tubing. Most people don't know what it means. But they're just they're thicker on the ends where you do your welding. Because the welding affects the the strength of the material, so it has to be a little bit stronger where you where you heat it. And then the, the middle of the tube where you don't heat it can be a lot thinner and a lot lighter. So you save some weight. And then the, each tube comes in a certain length and the butts are a certain length as well. You remove some of that to get your finished tube length. So you, we can really tailor each individual tube for each bike and, and dial in, optimize the weight of the bike and optimize the ride quality, mostly through the diameter and wall thickness of the tube. Okay, so, so in your- tune the feel of the ride, optimize it for weight and strength. So in that sort of get to know the customer process, you're learning their weight and riding mm -hmm. style. Exactly. And you can make adjustments to the way the bike feels based on what they're telling you, how they ride. Exactly. 
Exactly. Yeah. We have people come to us. Oh, yeah. I used to be a, a football player and I'm pretty big and I stomp on my bike, but I, I want a really light bike packing bike. And we're like, all right, we're going to make it a little heavier and we're going to use a little bit bigger tubes and it's going to give you the best ride. And then on the other side, we have somebody that's 100 pounds and they don't they need and they don't want the bike to feel like a dead brick we can either use a smaller diameter tube or lighter to tailor to that to their style and their their size and their and everything for most of the listeners i'm imagining that they aren't custom bike owners as someone when they're going through the purchasing process obviously the sky's the limit tube lengths things like that that you can help work with them on how do you help yeah, guide so people to get to the right spot yeah, yeah. The way that we work, we we try to make it approachable and easy. That was another goal of ours with Breadwinner. Was we had when I made my Pereira cycles, I was like, "What kind of do you want?" And I would make you a road bike or a cross bike. Or they didn't have names. There were no model names of any kind. But and I realized that that was that made it hard for people to come through the door. So now we have like our gravel bikes. Our first one was called the B Road. And B roads are like rural roads in, in the Midwest where Ira grew up. And, and so you, you would say, okay, I want a B road and that has a carbon fork and a steel frame. And we work with the people on their, with their fit and everything and how they want the bike to ride. The design side's all on us. The customers, our customers, sometimes they want to have more say in what goes where. And, but we've got a pretty good idea for what works and the materials we should use. So, yeah. so we handle all that. And then, yeah. And then the components whatever you want. So that B road model sounds like maybe it was the gravel bike extension of that continental. That was, was it more in the kind of road plus world than the it was big a tire mountain? To a cross bike. Actually. Okay. Yeah. We based it on our cross bike mostly because at the time the carbon forks you could get that would fit a wider tire were cross forks. Yeah. So it kind of just fit into that realm. And we were, we were very limited in what tires there were at that time. You know, there was the, the Panaracer Pacella, which was really popular. Jan Heine from Rene Harris, which was Compass, which before that was something else. I can remember what he called it then. And there was another name before Compass. But those tires were around. Anyway, they weren't very wide. I think our first B-Road had 32s on it which is like a big road tire now. Yep. So yeah, we did the B road for a while, I think two years. And then people started asking for 650B with you know, a wider tire and said, all right, how are we gonna do that? There wasn't a carbon fork to use. So we talked to our friend, uh, Chris Eigelhart, who's across the street from us over here. And he's been making those segmented forks since he was at Fat City back that, in the 80s. That's so, the moment you said that, and I've got a picture up of that fork right now, and you're absolutely right. That was the fat fork. Yeah, so Chris was the guy that made all those forks. Amazing. Yeah, and he's now across the street. And he also welds all our bikes. So Ira and I have, we still touch every bike, and I, I tack weld all the bikes, but Chris does our finish welding. Gotcha. You know, we build three bikes a week, so we can't have a, a welder on staff. We can't. They just can't have somebody. It's not a full-time job. Yeah. So ever since the very beginning of Breadwinner, we've built over, we've built going on 900 bikes now. Chris has welded every one of them. And so when we decided we were going to, we were going to do another bike soon to be called the G road. We went to Chris and Hey, how about we use an Eagle fork? And he was all for it. And man, those forks, he's got some magic dust in those forks. They are, they're spectacular and they look like the old fat forks, but they're not, they're just the same style. He has a custom drawn, um, fork leg made by Reynolds. It's a one inch heat treated steel tube that the fork blades are made out of. And he has his own little gussets that he uses and is the way that he puts them all together. Just they're a magical fork. They have a really fantastic ride quality. And to go back to your earlier question about why steel, it really has a, a fantastic ride quality. It just, it's springy and lively and it's stiff when you need it to be, but compliant enough that it's really comfortable. I, I feel like it's everything that a carbon bike designer is trying to, trying to work out. You're probably right there. Yeah. Yeah. If, oh, if we could only make this bike ride like a steel bike. And many of them do. Some of those carbon bikes are beautiful they ride great but anyway that yeah the g-road steel fork is fantastic and that's still what differentiate differentiates the b-road from the g-road the b-road is the carbon fork gravel bike the g-road is a steel fork 
Both can be built with 700C or 650B wheels. The B road, we now use the, the NV, the G series fork, the gravel fork, which works with 650B and it's got the mounts for cargo cages and internal wiring for lights. It's got all that stuff that we couldn't get before and that's that was what got us going with the Eagle fork. The Eagle fork, it's got a straight inch and an eighth steer tube. So it has a different aesthetic to it. It's yep. a more slender bike. It looks like an old school mountain bike. Yeah. We usually set them up with drop bars, but sometimes we do a flat bar too. And man, a flat bar G road feels a 1993 fat city, fat chance. That would be an amazing it, bike to have in your it's quiver. It's real fun, real fun. It's probably a little lighter than that bike was just because the tubes are better now. Yeah. But yeah, I, I love that. I love that style of bike. It's really fun to ride. Yeah. Amazing. That brings me back to those early mountain bike days. And which one will you be riding in the Grodio out in Utah? I've got a, I've got, it's actually the bike that we brought to Envy last year. It's the, it's a B road with, and last year the, was when they launched that adventure fork. I, that's what it's called. It's called the adventure fork. And so yeah, B road with the adventure fork. And I've got 650B, I've got these G1, the Schwalbe G1 bite, the two the 2.0. That's such a fun tire. And Again, it's like a really lightweight, old school cross country tire. It reminds me of a, like an old Continental. Damn, what was that? The Vertical Pro. Do you remember that tire? I don't remember that one. <laughs> but I do, I do love and appreciate that tread pattern. I'm a Panaracer Gravel King Plus guy, uh-huh. or S, uh-huh. excuse me, the SK for the most part. And I love the way it rides on the road, but it's super capable off road. So. You'll see that on my bike out in Utah. Yeah, cool. Tony, I appreciate the overview. I'll have links to all the the bikes and the pictures and the, everything the listener needs to get to know Breadwinner a little bit better. Excellent. Thank you so much. Cheers. So that's it for this week's edition of the Gravel Ride Podcast. Big thanks to Tony for joining us this week and telling us all about Breadwinner Cycles. Definitely head on over to breadwinnercycles.com to check out what they're doing up there. And if you're in Portland, check out the Breadwinner Cafe. You'll be able to see the bikes and get a nice cup of coffee. Huge thanks to Envy for their sponsorship of this week's podcast. Make sure to visit them at envy.com. Check out all the great gravel components and their new custom frame. If you're interested in connecting with me, head on over to theridership.com and join our free global online community for gravel and adventure cyclists. We'd love to get your feedback for future episodes and give me your thoughts on what Tony's working on at Breadwinner. Finally, if you're interested in supporting the show directly, you can visit buymeacoffee.com slash the gravel ride. Until next time, here's to finding some dirt under your wheels. <laughs>